adapted NetWatch unit. Find out more at netwatchsystem.com. NetWatch, creating a fearless environment. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. Now you're very welcome back. Sunday Paper Review, Joe Malloy with you this afternoon. I will start with the front page of the Sunday Independent here, which has a picture from Crow Park last night. Reen O'Neill beating Evan Comerford to score Armagh's first goal. They were 2.15 to 1.13 winners over Dublin in the opening uh, Division 1 match of the Allianz Football League. Beneath that, the headline is about Frank Lampard, who's going to be unveiled by Everton later on this afternoon as their new manager and it's Lampard wants old pals on the Everton ticket his old pals being Joe Edwards and Anthony Barry who obviously we're very familiar with and it seems Chelsea reports uh, Matt Law and Sam Wallace here Chelsea very likely to leave a decision over their futures to the individuals in question rather than trying to pressure them so Anthony Barry may be on the move to Everton Lampard they also report has decided not to work with Jody Morris this time around he was with them at Derby and at Chelsea Sunday Times Dubs in the Dumps is their headline again it's a picture from Crow Park last night this time it's Sean Bugler struggling to stop reading O'Neill of Armagh who was very much man of the moment last night he was brilliant Armagh stunned Crow Park with shock win in the league opener and alongside that Reds as in Liverpool Reds closing on Diaz as Spurs chase Juventus Gio so uh, Luis Diaz has begun his medical with Liverpool it seems the uh, Porto and Colombian winger is going to sign for 37 Point five million sterling up front anyway might be another 12 million in add-ons across the course of that deal is the general reporting uh, back page of the mail on Sunday then Lampard's United raid so Frank Lampard new Everton manager and it seems Donny van de Beek is who he wants as a January signing and Manchester United seemingly open to that as well so van de Beek may be on the move to Goodison and then the main picture on the back page of the Mail on Sunday is Kieran Kilkenny being tackled by two Armagh men. That was a feature of the game last night. Individual Dublin players being surrounded by Armagh jerseys. Stunning start to league as Dubs are blitzed by Armagh. Again, 2.15 to Dublin's 1.13. It was the scoreline last night. Back page of the uh, Star. It's Donny van de Beek as the lead here. Don Deal, Lampards after van de Beek as a first deal for new Toffees regime. And then we go to the Sunday world. Deja blue. So another defeat for Dublin. Disastrous is the word they go with here in back page of the Sunday world. Disastrous league start for Desi's dubs as they're well beaten at Croker again. Uh, Sean McGoldrick here. Dublin suffered a shock reversal last night in the opening round of the Alliance League at Croke Park. And then we'll go to the Sunday mirror. And it's a picture of uh, Liverpool's new signing. Uh, cop to bargain. Liverpool have got Luis Diaz for half the price after sealing a stunning £50 million deal for the Colombian winger, it seems. Initially, uh, Porto were looking for more, but uh, Liverpool have done good business, is the uh, feeling. And then we have the Observer, and they go with uh, Ash Barty, ending Australia's 44-year wait for a home champion. Yesterday, brilliant picture of her celebrations after winning in straight sets. As we speak, by the way, Nadal and Medvedev into the fifth set and it's Nadal uh, 3-2 and serving so break a serve for Nadal by the looks of things in the fifth set there and then finally Sun Sport Orchard in full bloom Croker shocker for sorry dubs and again it's a picture of Reno O'Neill finishing off his chance and beneath that head cases is the headline on the back page of the Sun this is a significant story I think fears uh, Sadio Mane is picked four days after concussion so Sadio Mane has been warned he's risking his health by playing today. Liverpool have raised concerns with Senegal after the star was declared fit for tonight's Africa Cup of Nations quarter-final just four days after being knocked unconscious and then collapsing on the pitch following a sickening clash of heads. And if this was in the Premier League, their concussion protocols would be such that he would not be allowed to play until tomorrow. So if you missed the previous game, Mane, it was a sickening clash of heads and he looked to be unconscious and he got up and played on and he scored a goal but then he collapsed and he was taken off and now he's deemed fit to play four days on so head cases cop alert over star Liverpool not commenting publicly to the sun or elsewhere but you can imagine their thoughts I would suspect now very happy to say we are joined by Grania McElwan broadcaster with TG Gahar RT and Sky Sports hey Grania great to have you on Hi Joel, good to be here. And Kieran Cunningham, Chief Sports Writer with the Irish Daily Star. That Sadio Mane story catches the eye, Kieran. It does, yeah. Um, 
I actually saw the the clash of heads the other day. I, I watched a fair bit of that game, and I couldn't believe he was left on the pitch. You know that uh, he went on to score a goal, and they took him off then after you know entirely even more unwell. But you know when you've heard so much about head injuries over the last few years, I still see the situations like this. That you know you'd question how some teams still operate. You know because. He looked like a guy who should have been taken out straight away and shouldn't really be back on the pitch so quick. Yeah, well, he's all set to play this evening, so we suspect Liverpool may have something to say about that in due course. Grania, let's uh, dig into the papers. You've both picked out loads. We're not going to get to everything. Page two of the Sunday Times, Mick Foley here. Armagh win hints at a power shift. And that is the interesting question around Dublin right now. So Armagh were excellent for anyone who didn't see the game. A really promising performance from their point of view but Dublin in many ways are the story as people can appreciate so uh, Mick Foley writes here uh, will last night be recalled as another fork in the road for both why not and then from a Dublin perspective he says uh, for now last night will provoke for Dublin and another long night of the soul lost in the purgatory of what their team is becoming the end result was their first defeat at Crow Park in the league for three years a better second half performance wiped the blood off the scoreline but the cracks visible last night were, or sorry, excuse me, the cracks visible last year were all present again last night. And that was the big worry in many ways. And Mick Foley goes on to say their shooting was poor, their shot selection was worse, they conceded frees that put them in trouble, their bench looked light, and Dublin looked lost when they needed leaders. He does add the caveat that James McCarthy, Mick Fitzsimons, and Conor Callanan and a few others are set to return. But, Grania, uh, his key point there is this was a continuation I suppose of some of the slippage and standards we saw last year that's the worrying thing for Dublin I think so but I, I think in a way Joe it's natural that that's going to happen like you cannot replace the players that they have had when you look at those epic finals that they had against Mayo over the years and you had players like Bernard Brogan and Paul Flynn and Kevin McMahon and Michael Darren McCauley all of them like former players of the years multiple all-stars coming in and saving out Jermot Connolly as well another player that would have come off the bench and, and did the business for them like those players don't exist at this moment in time and I think t- to expect them to continue to be that team that won six in a row, I, I don't think that's fair on them or fair on the new players coming through either to expect that. So Dublin are definitely at a crossroads. There's definitely a period of change. And I think Desi Farless came out and said that afterwards as well. Like there is a rebuild that needs to take place and will take place and could be quite painful. And if you compare this team maybe to the great Kerry teams of, of the 70s and the 80s, they went through a period of transition and a painful period of transition as well, Joe, in terms of finding new players. Because obviously when you have players of that calibre, and I think maybe you mightn't admit it, but the same investment and maybe the same process of looking for players might have been to the same extent that would have been expected and experienced previous to that. That definitely would have been a reason in Kerry that a lot of players that were good just didn't get the chance to get on the team and then fell out of love with the GA or just weren't involved. And then we were looking for those players, their particular investment hadn't been hadn't happened, so they didn't have those players to pick from. Now, Dublin, you can't say that that's going to happen. They obviously have a, a hugely successful system in getting players and bringing them through. But, you know, what we've seen from Dublin over the years, they've been um, once in a generational type of players. So I think it's inevitable we are going to see that declining. And... You know, the, people talk about Dublin. Maybe well, Ar- Dublin might not win another All Ireland for another number of years. You know, they might not win it for another ten. Like you just don't know. I mean, you have brilliant players there, but I think to just put all of that on one league game as well. You know, time will tell. I think a big test will be next weekend against Kerry, who are traditional rivals. That, that they never play particularly well in Kerry or win in Kerry. But I think it'll just be interesting to see the attitude. But I think Mick was right. Everything he said, just their decision making, their. Their wides and um, their discipline actually, I find really interesting as well. Like, you know, they conceded a lot of frees, and I just thought, you know, that scoring opportunities never, you know, they took shots, which one hand you can commend and say, great, they're going for shots. But on the other hand, when is the last time we've seen Dublin just taking shots without recycling the ball, looking with that player in the better position? But I want to talk about our magic because I think they deserve massive credit and we've seen a ma- huge improvement in them as well. And Kieran McGinney and his management team deserve massive kudos for what they have done. I mean, they look really fit. They look really lean. You could seriously see players like, like really lean had lost some weight as well. They just looked really strong and really fit 
for this time of the year. I thought their game plan was excellent and the style of play was lovely to watch. Like it was just kicking game. And they have a player of calibre of, of Rian O'Neill, who's just not, we you know, we've talked about Rian O'Neill over the past number of years, but just a really fabulous display from him. Their subs came on and make a massive difference. But I think Kieran McGinney as well is very um, aware that it's the first league game too, but it's it's a massive kudos for them in Division One, which is going to be really difficult to stay in. So it's a huge, huge um, night for Armagh. And again, we'll see how they perform. Can they continue that consistency against Toronto next again? And just then for Dublin, it's that leadership group, and it's seeing how they will react against Kerry next weekend. Yeah, totally agree with all that. Mick Foley concludes by saying for Dublin, their reaction against Kerry with the hotels and guest houses of Tralee already booked up by the dubs like it was summer could ripple throughout their entire season. Uh, Kieran, what do you take from last night? How much do you read into last night with a view to the season ahead for the dubs? Well, I'd read what I'd read into it is, is, is part of a pattern. You know, I, I think Dublin, this Dublin team or the great Dublin team came to a natural stop at the end of the five in a row and that's why Jim Gavin walked away. You know, it was that did you know some of them have admitted it since in interviews. It took a huge amount out of them, which was understandable. And you look through the amount of All Ireland medals that have left that squad. Even since last June, forty-seven All Ireland medals have been out of that squad. That's only you know eight or nine months, and it's hard to replace that uh, experience and that quality. And you know, when uh, they announced the team sheet yesterday. And I thought, well, I think it was the Dublin team that started. And I, when I saw that team, I thought, that's a really beatable team. If you were not our mad dressing, it wouldn't be intimidating. And even before Mayo beat Dublin last year, Dublin stumbled through Leinster. They hit no great heights. They looked more ordinary in Leinster than they had in 10 years. Uh, they were up and down in the league. And the previous year, even though Desi Barr won all Ireland in his first year, it was such a strange championship. And it was a winter championship behind closed doors. And because it was straight knockout, you had the shocks of Cabin and Tipperary, which were great. But they took out. That meant Dublin were going to come up against a Kerry or a Tyrone or a Donegal. You know, so they were, you know, it was an All-Ireland that kind of fell into their laps. It was actually the easiest All-Ireland they won of all the eight that they won over the last decade. So I think this decline has been there for a while. It does give the lie and it makes you question the whole notion of it's all been about money and structures and population. Because they still have all of that. But the quality, you know, there was five or six players at least there last night that looked to me like standard inter-county. You know, they, you know, you get as as good in Division 2 or 3 teams. You know, still have a core of outstanding players. But if you look at the players that come in, Conal Callaghan is prime. But Johnny Cooper, Mick Fitzsimons, James McCarthy. By the summer, two of them will be 32, one of them will be 33. There will be a huge amount of mileage on the clock. You know, I think, I would be astonished if Dublin won the All Ireland this year. That's being honest. I think with the resources, and you will expect it to get players that come. I don't think the lever go as long as they did before when they had long gaps, like 16 years or 23 years. But I would, I think that the, the, the transition might take longer than expected. And the other thing you can't ignore is the impact of Jim Gavin as coach. They were the best coach team I've ever seen. Like they were so calm under pressure, rarely making mistakes, always taking the right options. Over the last while, they've been taking the wrong options all the time. And it's not even the whites total. The whites tallies used to always be around four or five every game, game after game. Last night it was three times that. Like, they become so sloppy. Bad habits have crept in. And, you know, there was all this thing, the amount of current and experts, and you'll see a reaction from Dublin because of what happened to Mayo. But you can't really have a reaction when a lot of the guys coming in are just trying to get that jersey and make an impact. Like, they, they can't think of a bigger picture in that will put down a marker and show Mayo was just a blip. They're trying to make their mark as inter-county players and show they should be on that team. So this could be a very difficult league because it's a very strong league. It's a very strong Division One, And I think the aura, Dublin aura, has at least been dented. And a lot of teams will feel they have a chance now, maybe even in Leinster. So, Gron, you're taking all that then as red. It does suggest that much of the media commentary about Dublin over the last couple of years was totally wrong. That it was uh, suggesting Dublin would win six, seven, eight All-Irelands out of every decade, that demographics had been harnessed and much of the country would never stand a chance again. It seems really like a lot of former Dublin players would say things like, look, you've got a, a once-off freak generation and you've probably got a generational manager as well. And a lot of us probably discounted that and said, no, 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 next manager in, next group players in, it's never going to stop. So it looks like it has stopped. It looks like the claims 
many former players made that this was just a freak generation and a freak period might well be proved correct. I think so, Joe. Um, I mean, it's it's no one's given right that they're going to win in All Ireland. It's they're very hard earned, and I know there's nothing soft about winning All Ireland. And I totally agree with Kieran said about um, Dublin winning that sixth one. Um, it was a very strange year and strange times. But it, it is whoever wins it. You know, they've won it a hard way. They've, they they deserve that title to get there. Um, they were once in generation type players, and. I, you know, people would have said that about the Kerry team too, Joe, that this is it, they're going to continue on for him. But it comes to a natural end. Players come to natural end. And even the players that are left from those great teams, like the like of Brian Fenton and Kieran Kilkenny, like the expectation on them to change games and Conor Callan coming in, like they can't do that because they don't have that support either behind them. And we talk so much about the fours in the midfield, like people forget how defensive minded Dublin have been over those times that they've won, or the five, six years that they've won all Irons as well. Like they have been excellent in defence and last night they looked in total disarray. Like they just didn't seem to have that, you know, just players that experience like David Byrne caught a few times, you know, just kind of just things that you wouldn't have expected them. So they're either, as a lot of commentators say, they're either working on new things or they're just not at the pace. But I think over the league we'll see a lot from them. Mm. Well, no, I don't. I would agree with Kieran. I'm not sure that they'll win an All Ireland this year, unless we see a massive, drastic improvement from them. But I think the expectation on the players that have a lot of mileage on the on the legs too, like being with that Dublin side over the last number of years, and the new players coming in who are, as Kieran rightly says, just trying to make a mark and get that Dublin jersey, and perhaps that that um, competition for places isn't what it was at either. You know, so they're they're. They're challenging times for Desi Farrell in Dublin at the moment. And it's challenging because that narrative that have been there over the past number of years that they were just going to miraculously continue on winning all Ireland, it, it doesn't work like that. And I think um, we'll see if Dublin can get another one out of it. But I like that's six in a row. I mean, I don't think we'll ever see that happening um, in the next 20, 25 years in my lifetime anyway of, of teams doing that. Like it's a phenomenal, phenomenal achievement. I think we should admire what they have achieved and trying to expect them to do that again. I don't think that's fair. Okay. Uh, before uh, we've got two three minutes here before New Zealand, so I don't want to start anything uh, which will take us too long. Just uh, we might briefly, Kieran, mention Mick Foley's piece on page four of the Sunday Times. You both wanted to touch on this. GA can't afford for proposed changes uh, to fail. You might just sum up what Mick's talking about here and why it grabbed your eye. Because uh, yeah, the reason it caught my eye is because uh, you know he brings up the the system around uh, the, the Tommy Murphy Cup before and the opposition that was there with uh, to it with a lot of counties. And I think, you know, he's highlighting here something that a lot of people don't real, realise, which is what is a stake for the Division 2 counties, especially. And Division 2 is a hugely competitive division. Like, you look at the last uh, fully completed normal league before COVID, it was 2019. Well, down to the last uh, round of games in that league, four teams were it's still in the hunt for promotion. One had already been relegated and another four were in danger relegation. So there was something there, you know, everything was still to play for going down to the last day for all the teams. So this time around, the bottom two teams were going to the Tolton Cup. And if you look at the teams that are in Division 2, like Cork and Down are there. Cork won the All Ireland 2010, beaten down in the final. You know, uh, uh, Galway are there. You know, Meath are there. There's so many strong counties, which are seen as traditional strong counties that are there, that could drop into the Tolton Cup. And they're into a league with massive stakes. And just, uh, you know, mixed pieces just about this league, between league and championship, that's been created and it's very important. It just raises the stakes all around. Yeah, in many ways it does make Division 2 the most interesting division of the lot. We're going to take a very short break for news headlines. We've loads to get through in rugby. Neil Francis interviewed in the Sunday Times by David Walsh. Tyke Furlong interview as well. Lots of Six Nations preview. There's plenty more GAA as well. We have Jonathan Northcroft on Frank Lampard, Dennis Walsh on uh, some of the hypocrisy around our uh, talk of Saudi sports washing and the golfers. Declan McBennett, or he had a sport interviewed as well, and a few other pieces besides. We'll take a short break. I should let you know, by the way, Rafa Nadal should be serving for the Australian Open in about five minutes. Medvedev is serving at 5-3 down. Assuming he takes that, Nadal will be serving for the championship, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, not least when you consider he was two sets to love down in this match and uh, he's 35 years of age now, so on the cusp of winning Grand Slam title number 21. We're back with Grania Michael Wayne and Kieran Cunningham in just a moment. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Listen live or listen back on the News Talk app. 
powered by Go Loud. From morning to night, we've got something for everyone on News Talk. Good morning, you're listening to Breakfast Briefing on News Talk with me, Shane Beatty, bringing you the nation's first look at this morning's news. I think an arts degree broadens the mind, it educates yeah, you. Yeah, I actually agree with you, but do what you're interested in. Good morning and welcome today. Masks for slow learners, Neffet sees the light at last. 1800 453 106 if you want to get in touch. Has anyone considered the possibility that the universe is God? Says Graham. well obviously you have. There's generally about a 1 in 11 million chance Ray and Kenny takes in to say as Jim Carrey would say so there's a chance this is news talk the home show on the home show podcast this week from firing clay with cow dung to making clocks and toilets we catch up with keith brimer jones the head judge from tv hit the great pottery throwdown as home prices continue to soar we look at the places and properties that are proving most popular i meet the artist making exquisite decanters and goblets in ceramics And Roisin Murphy will be looking at how to turn the humble window box into a design statement. The Home Show with Sinead Ryan. Find us on the Newstalk app, which is powered by Go Loud. At Harvey Norman, we've got big deals on large capacity washing machines, like the Zanussi 10kg washing machine with Clean Boost Steam program that reduces bacteria on your clothes. Now 449. Or get the Siemens 10kg 2-in-1 washer dryer with a 60-minute wash and dry program, perfect for busy families. Now 849 save 150 euro. And we're matching all competitors' prices, even their sale prices. Shop our big deals safely in our spacious stores or online at harveynorman.ie. About 200,000 adults across Ireland may require support exercising their right to make decisions. For example, they may have an intellectual disability, a mental illness, an acquired brain injury or dementia. Later this year, the state will launch an essential public service to support adults with decision-making capacity issues. The new Decision Support Service is now reviewing its draft codes of practice and would like to hear from stakeholders and members of the public. To learn more and to play your part, please visit decisionsupportservice.ie. Insuremycars.ie Don't cut corners on your car insurance. Get a better quote at insuremycars.ie Ireland's trusted car insurance specialists. We search the market to get you the best cover at the lowest prices. Insuremycars.ie City Financial Marketing Group Limited Trading as insuremycars.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Fuse box gone haywire. Water pressure too weak. Boiler finally gone kaput. Oh. The good news is, there's a local hero for that. Boilers, plumbing, electrics, locks and drainage. Take the hassle out of home repairs with localheroes.ie. Our online service connects you with trusted tradespeople in your area. And all work comes with a 12-month guarantee, backed by Board Gosh Energy. Get a quote in minutes at localheroes.ie. Terms and conditions apply. You know how every part of your business works. Square is how it all works together. Square has tools to help you manage everything. Point of sale, online, payments, and so much more. So you can take your business anywhere and keep it all connected. With less work for you and more ways to stay open to what's next. Square, the shape of things to come. Visit square.com to learn more. Square Up International Limited trading as Square is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Live racing at Leopardstown Racecourse is back. Don't miss Dublin Racing Festival on Saturday, February 5th and Sunday 6th. A day out with your mates that goes long into the night. With Six Nations Rugby live on the big screen and amazing music live on the big stage. It's a feast of Dublin culture and a feed of Dublin flavours. And with a little luck, it's freaking out when your horse comes in. Dublin Racing Festival. More than racing more than a festival. Book now at leopardstown.com. Advanced purchase only. <clears throat> okay then, who's got my lines? Thanks. Right now would be a good time to find your local Dacia dealer. Now hang on, this isn't a movie here, is it? Uh, no. At Dacia, we don't make movies. We make cars. Like the new Dacia Sendero and Sendero Stepway. It says here, on the road from just 30 euro a week? Yeah. Nice. Offer is made under a higher purchase agreement. Payments drawn monthly. Terms and conditions apply. See dacia.ie. Hate missing out? News Talk Extra is news, entertainment and all the latest podcasts. Plus expert tips and competitions straight to your inbox. Subscribe now at newstalk.com slash extra. Moncrief. 
we were talking about the phrase jacking. One person texted in saying they didn't really know where the, the phrase come from. It seems to be fairly well established. Uh, Sid says uh, the word jacking comes from the fact that in Dublin, we had jacks or toilets inside. The Colchies didn't. That's what we were always told. Yeah. Revisionist history. Moncrief. Brought to you by Avant Money. Weekdays at 2 p.m. on News Talk. On 106 to 108 FM. On the News Talk app, powered by Go Loud and Smart Speaker. This, this is News Talk. It's two o'clock. Good afternoon, I'm Tom Douglas. The victims of Bloody Sunday have been remembered during a memorial service to mark 50 years since the killings. 13 people died after British soldiers opened fire on a march in Derry in 1972. A 14th man later died. Huge crowds took part in a remembrance march this morning, while hundreds also attended a memorial service and wreath-laying ceremony. On Taoiseach, Foreign Affairs Minister and the Sinn Féin leader were among those who attended. Bernie Quigley's brother Jackie was one of the Bloody Sunday victims. She says the turnout today was heartwarming. It was never in doubt. After all these years, the people are still feeling it, even as much as we are as family members. The Bishop of Derry, Donald McKeown, made a speech and said a prayer during today's memorial service. It's not a sad day. It's a day touched with sadness, but a day of pride and, and, and dignity and solidarity. Over a third of young women say they've been sexually harassed in public in the past year. A new Red Sea poll in the Business Post today shows almost 4 in 10 women aged between 18 and 34 have experienced this in the streets. Nolene Blackwell, Chief Executive of Dublin's Rape Crisis Centre, says this is, that society needs to stop this out. There has to be a change in behaviour, um, particularly in men's behaviour who think that this is acceptable or funny or in any way appropriate. Rogue businesses could be fined up to €10 million Euro or 10% of their global turnover under new competition laws. The rules will give more powers to consumer protection bodies to challenge bad practices. The UK is to introduce fresh sanctions on Russia as it steps up its efforts to stop it invading Ukraine. Liz Truss says Britain's using deterrence and diplomacy to avoid conflict. However, she also says it'll be offering extra support to NATO allies and weapons to Ukraine to strengthen its own position. Britain's Foreign Secretary says current sanctions will also be widened this week. So any company of interest to the Kremlin and the regime in Russia would be able to be targeted, so there will be nowhere to hide. That's it for now. More at three. News Talk Weather. Thanks to Ryanair. Eat, sleep, ski with Ryanair flights to the slopes of France, Italy or even Bulgaria. Staying relatively dry in most parts for the day with the odd patch of drizzle in the west or the midlands. Very windy though with a yellow weather warning for strong gusts affecting County Donegal from 2pm. Top temperatures of 10 degrees. And now you're up to date on News Talk. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. Well, the tennis quite extraordinary. Rafa Nadal was serving for the championship in Melbourne and Medvedev broke serve. So it's now five games apiece in the fifth set in the men's final. So Nadal may come to rue that chance. He was serving at 5-4 and Medvedev incredibly broke serve. Nadal's come from two sets down to bring this to five sets, by the way. So it's been a really extraordinary uh, men's final this morning or this evening in Melbourne. We're chatting through the Sunday papers. Kieran Cunningham of the Star, Chief Sports Writer with the Star and Grania McElwain, broadcaster with RTE, TG Gar, Sky Sports with us. We'll come back to the GA. We've started uh, down the GA route talking about the dubs. Let's uh, jump around a little bit because there are lots of pieces we want to get to. Six Nations starts next week. Kieran Neil Francis unveiled by the Sunday Times as their columnist. Uh, he was obviously with the Sunday Independent for a long time. He's been writing for 30 odd years now and Player's Diary, uh, even towards the end of his career with Paul Kimmage. So page 10 and 11 and into page 12 here is all Neil Francis because he also has his uh, first column for the Sunday Times where he's talking about Ireland's passing game and the All Blacks and hoping it continues. Uh, the interview with David Walsh what grabs you here? Uh, well, it's not so much the substance of the interview. Like, uh, I don't think there's huge amounts. Um, like, even some of the stories that um, Neil Francis tells David Walsh, you know, the, like one about him meeting Joel Schmidt in Goldstein one day, and uh, uh, 
you know, uh, when a group of workers in high vis jackets came in and he says, uh, uh, one of them stood up and says, you know, before we go upstairs, it's important we recognize what this man has, has done for Irish rugby. And Joe was getting a bit embarrassed and Neil, Neil Francis said, uh, thanks lads for this, but I think Joe here deserves a bit of credit as well. No, I've heard, uh, I've read uh, Neil write about this before and a few of these other stories before, but what, what interests me is Neil Francis is back because a six months, like, they get to uh, this at the very end of the article, but six months since he was let go by the Sunday Independent after remarks he made about uh, Marcus Smith of the Harle- of Harlequins in England fly half, you know, or, uh, on the podcast about the Lions when he described him as a, having an oompa loompa tan and this became a huge, um, a huge controversy, and eventually the the, the Indo pulled the plug. The issue to state, so they were cut him in, cutting him adrift. And I was wondering would he crop up somewhere else, you know? Because I do believe it's important people have second chances. Like it's very much part of the human condition to mess up. We've all messed up, but, you know. You do benefit from being given another go. But Neil Francis, you know, he's trod a dangerous line at different times over the years, like even on this paper re- review a few years ago, he said some things that got him in hot water. But six, just six months in, he's back, you know, with, with another prominent, uh, in another major newspaper with a column of prominence. And it, it just made me wonder, like he, David Walsh, I think is quite friendly with Neil Francis. So is Paul Kimmage. Like Paul Kimmage wrote a few weeks ago or a few months ago about how there's a great book in Neil Francis. And it does seem to be so there's been an attempt to rehabilitate his reputation very quickly, and that 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 that, uh, that isn't always there for everyone. Like across the water, you know, like say people like Ron Atkinson said things, and you know, effectively the career was finished by it. There's no harm that he's got back in, but it makes me wonder because there's a line in here about Vincent Brown saying, "Get the lunatic number five to do a column." He's your man, you know. You want a maverick, and I think there's a lot to be said for using mavericks as columnists, like you know, in their own paper. Like with Lexi Gerald and Anne, Eamon McGee, Eamon Dunphy, they would be very much Mavericks and they look at the world a different way. But it, it just makes me think, uh, you know, he's been doing this since 1991. He's a very gifted writer. Like he writes his own columns. He's twice won awards for his, his columns. Like I remember his column on Willie, Willie Duggan from a couple of years ago. And a lot of people, a lot of columns are forgettable, but I remember that one vividly because it was superb. But I just wonder, where's the new Neil Francis? Like why hasn't another... Why are we going? Why are they going for somebody who's been right for thirty years? You know, I would have thought somebody new would have emerged by now. And also in the interview, I think it would be better if it was a more confrontational interview than if it wasn't somebody like David Walsh, who possibly is friendly with Neil Francis. I think he could have been challenged more on things he said over the years, on what he said last year. I think he could have pushed a bit deeper and say, you know, why did he? Why does he feel the need to say this stuff? and be what might, people might call edgy or people might fit call stupid. It's towards the end of the piece where that whole area comes up. So he mentions 09 when Dave Walsh writes that uh, he had taken to referring to the team as lady boys and inside the changing room that stung like no other insult. Neil Francis says here, if I was able to go back, I would never use the term but I first coined it about the Leinster team I played on so much talent but when the heat came on we turned off and that kept happening after a Leinster won the 09 Heineken Cup final the last line of Francis Peace on the game said lady boys no more uh, six months ago he lost a job at the Sunday Independent after making an inappropriate and offensive comment about the Harlequins in England fly half Marcus Smith in a podcast so what Neil Francis says here to Dave Walsh what I said was wrong and I did disparage Marcus Smith and I very much regret what I said it was something I would never have written. He says that he called the uh, media guy with the British and Irish Lions as Marcus was with the Lions at the time. I rang three or four times, left a message saying I would like to talk directly to Marcus as I wanted to apologise. Uh, Tim, the uh, Tim Percival, the media guy, never got back uh, to me. And Dave Walsh then goes on to say that at the time in exile brought uh, constant reminders of what sports writing means to him uh, more than he imagined. I realised how much I wanted to do it. Writing a column imposes a discipline that forced you to think things through. Before I started writing, it felt like my life was a series of reactions. It's a pleasure to sit down and engage in contemplative thought. I suppose, Kieran, as they announce their new columnist, they understandably may not want to relitigate the whole situation in massive depth and so there was probably a feeling that they had to address it without teasing it out in all its aspects that would be I feel 
or I suspect how they felt would be the best way to uh, deal with the situation? Uh, uh, that may well be the case, Joe. It wouldn't surprise me at all. You know, I do think if he really, you know, he could have got Marcus Smith. You know, like uh, Marcus Smith wasn't on, on Lions duty for the last six months. You know, he was out there for a few weeks, you know, so he said he would try to go through Tim Percival of the Lions at the time. And surely if he really wanted to, you know, push and make the show his contrition to Marcus Smith, he could have contacted him since then, you know. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm very conflicted over this. Like, I, I think there's been a bit of an old pals act going on here and it's just sorting out a buddy. And um, he's a guy that uh, has a track record that is patchy. He's a brilliant writer. But he said a lot of things that other people wouldn't get away with and constantly got away with them. And, if, you know, even even with that podcast last year, we it wasn't until last year, it wasn't until it was picked up in England. You know, the podcast was a week old and, you know, the Indo didn't move on him here. It, was, it wasn't until it became a controversy in the UK that they made a move, you know. So people facilitated him crossing the line for a long time. Yeah, well, I don't know the ins and outs of the podcast situation. Maybe it didn't come to widespread attention until it was highlighted in the UK or certainly the, the powers that be higher up. I don't know the ins and outs of that situation. We can only speculate there, so that's not a wise thing to do. Um, on, on the Old Pals Act, I think um, in fairness, in fairness, there probably is a good book in Neil Francis All the Same, so it's not an outrageous thing to say on Paul Kimmage's part and David Walsh does raise the issue here and discuss it with him. I understand your point that it could have been maybe more confrontational, might have been a benefit to, to both, but I suppose um, journalists make their choices in fairness. You know, David Walsh isn't here to defend his uh, treatment of the conversation. And uh, Grania, what strikes me, I, like the reason uh, Neil Francis has been hired again, as Kieran says, gifted writer and people still want to read him after all these years. And one of the reasons they want to read him is he does say things which get him into hot water and so there's always that tricky line with any of the controversial writers or pundits that we how do you handle it when lines are crossed and that's part of the appeal and part of the reason they're employed and to rehabilitate or to cast aside at uh, signs of trouble is the never-ending dilemma I suppose. Yeah, it is, Joe. Um, I mean, he's a type of character, you either like him or you loathe him. I, I don't, I haven't really met anyone that's kind of gone, he's grand or he's in between. I think you either like him or you loathe him. Um, I do think people deserve a second chance and he has owned up to the mistake that he's made. Um, I think often people maybe make mistakes, they don't own them and he, and he has. Um, but pundit as well, like I, I think when you're selling newspapers and, and these times it's it's so difficult to sell newspapers, somebody like this has had a track record of actually gaining traction for your newspaper whether that's good or bad um that's another another conversation another day but certainly he creates um attraction we're talking about and people talk about him and people will read his columns he writes good columns he has you know there's there's good stories and what he's saying in his columns he the i i enjoy the piece that with david walsh did with him i found it you know interesting quite funny as well the thing I was looking for, though, was the Marcus Smith incident. I thought that might have been earlier on in the piece. Yeah. Um, I appreciate maybe that that wasn't. And absolutely, I would have liked to have seen more challenge and other things that he has said. But I, he also strikes the character. I don't know him at all, but I think he kind of says things before he actually thinks. So in the podcast, when we're talking here now, you actually just think without saying in a, in a newspaper column when you're writing, you have time to think. And when you read things a few times, sometimes they don't come across the way that you should that they're supposed to be intended and i think that's a big thing as well for him that when he actually speaks he doesn't actually think i think of through what he's going to say um but yeah i think punditry it's you know if if they're looking for someone to talk about him if they want someone to actually look at a, a lot of nostalgia as well and, and kind of and he, he's not afraid to say things as he feels whether you agree with him or not i think that's one of the reasons why he's back yeah, as well, well. I, I, isn't I, and that's maybe the point you raised kieran which, you know, 30 years on, where is the next Neil Francis, you asked? I suppose 30 years on, the landscape has changed that uh, Neil Francis is probably even, you know, in his in his um, willingness to say things which will get him into hot water and to say exactly what he thinks about all sorts of things. He's arguably a rarer commodity now than he was 30 year, years ago, such as the a general softening in uh, punditry and public discourse generally, I would put it to you. Yeah, no, I think it's a reflection of the professional era in rugby. 
that um, you know interviews have become more sanitized. Like you look at, you'll see a lot of interviews in advance to Six Nations, and ninety nine percent of them will be completely disposable. You know, there'd just be nothing in them. They'd just be filling space, filling time. And, you know, um, you do see people like Willie Anderson's book and see, you know, that was a different generation, how fascinating that was. Keith Earls' book was fascinating too, and he's a current player. But I've always found out with Keith, Keith Earls that he stood out, like, he, from when he first came into the Ireland team in terms of his interviews, that they were they were, they were were just a bit more free-spirited. And, uh, you know, he wasn't towing... He was he was himself. He wasn't really towing party lines or throwing out prepared lines or whatever. You know, it's a shame of rugby you loses that because you have a lot of very bright people who come through it um, through the professional setup. And I'd like to just see them, some of them open up more. And you would like new voices, you know. Like Neil Francis has, as I said, he's done brilliant work over the years, but you'd like a new Neil Francis to emerge. See, I think there are new voices. It's just uh, very different style like somebody like Gordon Darcy for instance in the Irish Times writes b- brilliant columns uh, you know he teases the game apart and the tactics and, and gives forthright views on the game but it's 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 not in the style of controversy No but he has a maverick streak as well you know like he's you know Gordon Darcy we talked to you at length about his interest in Buddhism for example you know like he's a, he's interested in the, he's a very broad view of the world and I think that does help that so some of the new pundits, some are really good now. Like I find Andrew Trimble interesting to listen to. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you know, uh, you Brian O'Driscoll on, obviously. Ronald O'Gara, very, very interesting. But um, there's some of them just get too technical, I think, in the way they talk about the game. And they forget that to many people, rugby is a relatively new sport. And they don't really want to be bombarded with the technical stuff that was more at home at the coaching conference. And I think uh, Neil Francis is quite good at getting that balance right and that he gives information and ana- proper analysis. But he's also an entertaining writer and he's, uh, you know, throws in, uh, you know, anecdotes and references. Like today, he's writing about uh, Dick Fosbury of the Fosbury flop, who introduced that as a, a high jumping technique and how that caught on. And, you know, but he ties that into, the, into his preview of the Six Nations. And that there's just not as many, many pundits thinking more about thinking. As, sorry, not as many rugby columnists thinking of the reader and how to engage them. They're just kind of thinking of people they know that are fascinated by rugby, what they want to hear. Mm. I think they're not thinking of the general audience enough. I guess that's one of the reasons uh, Neil France is still very much in demand and is back writing again six months on from the Sunday Independent situation. Grania, on the Six Nations generally, there are tens of thousands of words uh, written across the Sunday papers ahead of weekend one of the Six Nations. What took your fancy or did anything? There was a few. Um, I'm trying to think where they are. I mean, we'll talk about one, I suppose, maybe just to talk about the one, if I'm sticking with the Sunday Times and we'll move on then to the Indo and the Daily Mail. But, you know, there's so much talk about um, the Six Nations, but one that caught my eye was a game by David Walt. It says, rugby can't go on like this. And it's just talking about concussion. It's just interesting when you started off with Manny at the start of the show talking about this, like this is another um, big talking point once more about it and, and the players that are obviously um, early stage dementia and other players that are taking cases, like um, uh, cases against um, lawsuits, I should say about this. So there's 160 rugby union players and 75 rugby league players have joined a lawsuit taking against the game's respective governing bo- bodies, claiming the authorities could have done more to protect them from brain damage and the big majority of these players are in their 30s and their 40s so that's really frightening I thought when you're in your 30s and your 40s because we're seeing players now that are retiring early 30s and yet some of them obviously um, are starting to have have dementia or some of them um, have had that over the number of years and he just spoke I talked about um, a, a Tim Carley 43 is among the 160 former union players and he had a conversation with a neurologist who's examined his brain two, mo- two months before a Kiwi Carly spent four years with Cornish Pirates in the English Championship and a further three seasons with Bourgeois in the French Top 14. Over the course of his career, he suffered multiple concussions and he has yet to find out, does he have uh, early dementia? Because he doesn't want to have that conversation, but is saying he has to. 
But he gives the example of Sam Underhill, who's 25 and, and one of today's players and also one of the England stars that have reached the 2019 World Cup final. Mm. And his problem is concussion. And they're just talking about, you know, he's been extremely impressive for Bath. Um, he had 23 tackles before a knock on the head that co- caused him to lose concussion. That was in September 2017. Two months later, he's playing for England against Australia. He suffers another concussion. And on return in early 2018, he spoke of the need to improve his tackle technique and make better decisions in the collision areas. So basically, he's suffering from concussion. And you kind of have to ask the question, and David Walsh does ask the question, of what of the concerns for Andre Hill himself. He's, he keeps trying to come back. He keeps coming back, but he suffers from concussion. And you're saying, how many concussions is too many concussions? And you're at this point saying like clubs and rugby unions will possibly will have to step in and go, well, as duty of care here, if some of your players are constantly getting concussed and we're seeing the evidence now from players that have played and that are in their 30s and their 40s that are suffering on this, there needs to be a very, um, I think, serious decision made about his future and other players like him that are suffering continuous concussions because the medical evidence is showing that that is it's a massive, massive problem. And I think clubs have a massive duty of care to players here. So it's just talking about different players, you know, Sam Warburton and his book as well. I found a really good article um, just talking about his concussion and how, you know, when George North came in and he said he got hit in the head and for half a second, I didn't know where I was or which day I was supposed to be playing. Um, and this was against the All Blacks in 2014. And um, Sam Warburton and, um, and Dan Lydia just kind of laughed and they just said, mate, that happens just literally every game. And you're going, gosh, like, so how many players have played through this? We're obviously knowing a lot more about concussion. There's more protocols and more safeguards involved in it. But I just think it's a very interesting to keep an eye on this because we're having a Six Nations competition now. And it's massive hope. We're all really excited about this because the start of spring is the start of, of seeing crowds back here in Ireland. And we're all very hopeful and we love watching the Six Nations. But just for some players as well, it's... um. It's going to be a difficult time and, and concussion is something obviously that's, that's huge. Dylan Hartley comes in as well and mm. um, talking about that too. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's, it's just I found a very interesting article, Joe. Yeah, you've summed it up brilliantly as well. That's, um, I mean, when he goes through Underhill, for instance, it really catches you because he's still just 25 and in the context of what the generation before him have gone through, you can't help but be slightly concerned on Underhill's behalf. And uh, Walsh does conclude the piece by talking now about how the concussion protocols have changed and in particular the gap you have to take between returning to play or not to play and it's down to a week now in many instances and uh, Walsh says even rugby's own people don't believe in the current return to play protocols so he quotes here Dr Ken Quarry who's a chief scientist with New Zealand Rugby he said if it was up to me players who've been concussed would not be able to return to play for at least a couple of weeks preferably longer and yet we do see some play return within a week and he gives an example of that in the piece as well in last June Luke Count Dickey was knocked out playing for Exeter in the Premiership final following weekend he played for the British and Irish Lions in South Africa so yeah rugby can't go on like this is the headline uh, the problem is Kieran, uh taking the physicality out of rugby is a fool's errand yeah it, it reminds me of an, an article uh, a column done Len Endel examiner a few years ago and it was very striking because he got he went through the numbers with all the provinces for the start of the club season. And he looked at the many players who were missing through injury for the start of the season. This was just after pre-season, after contact and training, whatever. And a lot of the uh, provinces were missing players in double figures, you know, 13, 14 players. And this was at the very start of the season. And it showed the incredible physical toll it, it's taking. And, you know, it, it, you know, the line has been used so often. Now, the, the, these players are the guinea pigs. You know, the the, the players in the, in the last 10, 15 years in the professional era are the guinea pigs because nobody really knows what impact it's going to have on this generation and the next generation on the way down the road. Like, it could have serious health questions for them. And, you know, I know a couple of Gaelic footballers, inter-county players, I won't say their names, but who had bad concussions and they're still playing for their counties. And I don't think they've ever been the same. I don't think they've ever reached anything like the same level. And I think people can underestimate the impact. Okay? Like, it's a brain injury. The concussion is very... It's a very uh, soft way of describing it. You know, it's kind of sweetness what it is. But a brain injury is serious. And, you know, you're, ha- you're seeing them week on week on week, particularly in the Six Nations, is so attrition. Mm. 
You know, it's uh, you know, there's so many games, usually physical games, in a short space of time that it takes a massive toll. And I think down the road we might be questioning that toll a lot. Yeah. Uh, I must say, increasingly, when you watch matches, it's hard not to have that in the back of your head, which uh, certainly undercuts them slightly. Was there any other Six Nations coverage you felt was worthy of a mention, Kieran, or you wanted uh, to touch Ty, on? Ty Furlong interview by uh, Stephen Jones, the Sunday Times, is good because there's just a few things I never really, uh, I didn't realise this, that uh, in professional rugby, you know, out halves are, are the best paid, which you would expect. But tight head props are next on the list. Oh, yeah. For the two best positions. And I knew tight head is you know, such a specialist position. It's such a difficult... It's just so hard to get top quality people uh, in that position. But I didn't realise it was at that level in terms of salaries because often the, the, the money situation probably is kind of... It's not highlighted that much. Like, compared to soccer, everybody knows what Mo Salah earns, for, the, for example, or Jaden Sancho. Like, people talk about these things all the time. But they don't talk about it as much with rugby. But... Like a lot of this stuff in the Tyke Furlong interview would be familiar to us because we know about his background at uh, Wexford Farm and he did the GA background. But you know, this was Stephen Jones for an audience in Britain as well. And there's just uh, it's just a nice interview. Like it you know, gives you a flavour of what Tyke Furlong is like and how he's made himself into uh, into a serious force, like into a world class prop. And you know, he, he just like became a kind of a cliche to credit GA with helping Irish rugby players. But, you know, he, he, he does highlights the way it helped him and that the GA is more like football. It's a 360-degree game of movement and space. And I think growing up from that perspective, it gave me the hand-eye coordination bit. And we do see that with the way he plays, you know, that he, he is very soft hands, for a tight head prop, and, you know, he's, he's nifty on his feet as well. So... Um, but, you know, there's a few funny things, like you talked about when he went up to Dublin, you know, and, you know, you have a bit of a chip in your shoulder from a farm in Wexford. You've been in with the, the guys from, uh, you know, private schools in Dublin. But, he, you know, he did say, you know, he said he felt so out of place that on his first night he could ring his mother to ask her how to cook oil in the bag rice, um, you know, uh, which is uh, probably the simplest thing you could cook outside a toast, I would think. Hmm. We've all been there. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's an. I, I enjoyed it. It's just, it, it really did feel like it was very much for a British audience, and so it's kind of, it's curious to read it from an Irish perspective. Even like the Sunday Times laying out the Championship head, all the TV schedules, it's just BBC and ITV, you know. So it kind of, you can feel like you're looking in a little bit, you know. I put it to Furlong that his beloved hurling is complicated and confusing, you know. <laughs> so it's very much aimed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At a funny, British uh, audience. The other thing that struck me, Joe, is there's a lot of it hurling. You know, there's a fair amount of reference to hurling, but the clips we've seen of Furlong yeah. over the years are playing guy like football. Like yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I think he was more a footballer than hurling, from what I remember. I'm open to correction on that. What comes across uh, more than anything is. I mean, we all love Tyke Furlong and this is definitely one of the better interviews. Stephen Jones comes away utterly in love with Tyke Furlong. So he finishes off by saying, as we parted after some of the most pleasurable time I can remember, is how he... He's just uh, trying to make up for all the people who say he hates Irish. Yeah, well... They're all like Tyke Furlong. He loves it. But it was really lovely, Joe, as well. He's so proud of where he comes from. And he always says in every interview, he's always talking about his farming background, his parents, that was the GAA. But what I really like as well is that he's very aware of his value. And, you know, for that for that young man that went up with a little chip on his shoulder and, the, you know, and I like that quote as well, talking about your massive chip on your shoulder there. Growing up, I would always think that they were silver, that they were silver spoons, very privileged, looked down on us. And that's something that definitely drove me on as a young lad. So he might have ended up thinking, gosh, they may be better than me or I'm not a good there. But certainly he has realised his true value and potential and to this Irish setup and to Leinster and the fact that he kind of held off in negotiations as a contract and, and stuff really showed that. So it was a really enjoyable interview and he comes across exactly how, as he appears on screen as well, like just very enjoyable, really, um, just just really relaxed individual and, and I say great company. Yeah, he's top of the heap now, that's for sure. Uh, interestingly, by the way, uh, Stephen Jones, who has seen it all really in the game of rugby, says that Furlong is one of the finest props in the sport for me conceivably the greatest I have seen so that is high praise indeed uh, we'll take uh, a moment to check in at St Conlet's Park Killian Whelan is watching Kildare against Kerry how are we looking Killian? 
Good afternoon to you, Joe. Uh, right, uh, temperature favour about this game, Joe. As you can imagine, St. Connors Park, back to the Raptors here. It's a bit like the Newbridge or Nowhere atmosphere. And Kildare, well, they're within touch of distance. 166, the goal, the difference after five minutes. Bit of a dispute and one. I'd love to see it back. Gavin White, who's subsequently gone off injured in the last couple of moments, with Amanda made a marauding run down into the dressing room entrance here of uh, St. Connors Park. The ball was recycled and it finished with Killian Splat, not really making a great connection with the ball at all, but somehow it got underneath uh, Mark Donnan's uh, legs and into the back of the net. That has been the different job. It's uh, been Sean O'Shea, a couple of points from uh, a Freeze and uh, also from Play Potty. Clifford has chipped in. David Clifford probably with the score of the game so far with lovely one off his left. And even Tom O'Sullivan has got forward to kick scores. Jimmy Hyland is the man that's keeping uh, the scenario for Kildare in touch there. They had started out of the blocks like a, a like a, an Olympic sprinter with uh, Paul Cribben and Kevin Flynn getting scores in the opening three minutes. But since then, Kerry got the goal. They've built on that and the lead here by 176 with a half an hour gone, Joe. Very good. Killian Whelan, thank you from St. Connors Park. Uh, updates throughout the afternoon on the GAA action. We'll take a very short break. Final uh, thoughts on the Sunday papers next. The Sunday papers on Off The Ball. The Home Show. On The Home Show podcast this week. From firing clay with cow dung to making clocks and toilets, we catch up with Keith Brimer jones the head judge from TV hit The Great Pottery Throwdown. As home prices continue to soar, we look at the places and properties that are proving most popular. I meet the artist making exquisite decanters and goblets in ceramics. And Roisin Murphy will be looking at how to turn the humble window box into a design statement. The Home Show with Sinead Ryan. Find us on the News Talk app, which is powered by Go Loud. If your child is aged 5 to 11, you can now register for their free COVID-19 vaccine. COVID-19 usually causes mild to moderate illness in this age group, but it can cause more severe illness. All vaccines used in Ireland are tested before they're approved by the European Medicines Agency. To find out more or to register, go to hsc.ie or call HSE Live on 1800 700 700 from the HSC. This is the sound of business owners bossing their day with Sage. Fish delivery bust. Invoices sorted. <laughs> Clients walk out bust. Expenses smashed. Tax return done. Take control of business with new financial tools from Sage. Boss it. Try for free at sage.com. Terms and conditions apply. This February, I've made a shocking discovery. The end of the world. I need you to be brave. Is on the horizon. It's highly likely our moon was built by aliens. Excuse me. From the director of Independence Day. We're planning to attack this thing. Suit up. I have debilitating anxiety. Halle Berry. This is gonna be close! Patrick Wilson. I didn't come this far to fail. John Bradley. Brian! Brian Papa! How many Brian's do you think are inside the moon? Moonfall. In cinemas and IMAX, February 4th, rated 12A. You know how every part of your business works. Square is how it all works together. Square has tools to help you manage everything. Point of sale, online, payments, and so much more. So you can take your business anywhere and keep it all connected. With less work for you and more ways to stay open to what's next. Square, the shape of things to come. Visit square.com to learn more. Square Up International Limited Trading as Square is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Meet Seamus. He and his wife are driving in their new Citroen C5 Aircross SUV to her birthday dinner, which he forgot in a restaurant that she had to book. She married a cliché. This could be a very uncomfortable drive. Except the Citroen C5 Aircross SUV comes with advanced comfort seating and progressive hydraulic cushion suspension, making it a very comfortable drive indeed. Citroen. Engineered for comfort. See citroen.ie. From serving your customers to choosing the right suppliers, running a business takes a lot of work, which is why FBD Insurance know that a little support can mean a lot. So we'll support you with a tailor-made business insurance policy unique to you. Visit fbd.ie to find your nearest branch and get a quote today. FBD Insurance. Support. It's what we do. FBD Insurance Group Limited, trading as FBD Insurance, is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. Business insurance is underwritten by FBD Insurance PLC. Hi, this is Eamon Coughlin. Have you got a moment? A huge amount changed in the last year, but not everything. 
Worldwide, hunger, homelessness and war still leave people desperate for food, water and shelter. In 14 countries, Goal is providing essential support, but we can only bring positive change thanks to Irish generosity. That's why we need your help urgently. Please donate whatever you can afford at goal.ie. There's still so much more to do. Thank you. The Sunday Papers on Off The Ball. Now you're very welcome back. So we're going through the Sunday papers here in the company of Grania McElwain and Karen Cunningham. Uh, loads to try and get through. I know you've picked out a bunch of other GAA pieces which we'll try and hit before we uh, finish up. A uh, few other ones which caught both your eyes. So uh, Dennis Walsh on Saudi sports washing which is a routine a discussion point I would think here in the Sunday papers and beyond uh, the golfers are heading to Saudi Arabia next weekend and that's been the subject of much discussion over the last couple of weeks and Dennis Walsh uh, starts off in making some uh, wider points Desert Storms is the headline of the piece critics of Saudi sports washing are right but why are golfers taking most of the heat and so for instance he talks about a recent trade mission in uh, November recently, Leo Varadkar and uh, 60 Irish companies spent two days in Saudi Arabia and uh, the LGBTQ abuses and human rights issues were discussed and they never threatened to remotely uh, derail the mission in any great way. The role of Enterprise Ireland is to grow exports and sustain jobs is uh, what was said at the time. He mentions as well, Dennis Walsh, the $20 million Saudi Cup, which will be uh, the centrepiece of racing in the Middle East very shortly. 80 overseas entries are expected, including horses trained in the UK, the US, France, Japan and Ireland. Willie Mullins, Jessica Harrington, all had runners last year. Joseph O'Brien sent horses a year before. Uh, he says, though, racing is just happy in its own world and consumed with itself and doesn't uh, get much criticism in the same way that the Formula One does, the boxing does, the golf does. And he talks to uh, Tom Ryan, a Tipperary native who works for the Saudi Jockey Club, who uh, makes the point not long after he arrived, the first uh, woman was employed by the Jockey Club. Now he says women make up 70% of people he works with. A couple of aspiring women jockeys have applied for a licence. Uh, talk, Dennis as well in this piece talks about how there was a Formula E event four years ago and alongside the race was the first ever concert where women and men could both attend and mingle freely. Uh, 2018, women given the right to drive and Dennis uh, points out at the same time a lot of the women who broke the rules when it was against the law are still in prison but the rule has changed. Um, on the Formula One track he cites a piece from Rebecca Clancy who spoke to a local women who were glad the circus had come to town not just for the work it gave them but for the spotlight it brought the point of sports washing was to persuade the world to see the kingdom differently to that end they need to give the world something different to see so there's a sense that maybe Saudi Arabia is inching towards more uh, desirable societal norms well still being behind though um, and Dennis finishes his piece by saying the uncomfortable stuff has been compartmentalised uh, for the golfers and for the Irish trade mis mission he uh, says that there have been scathing pieces written about uh, the golfers in recent times he cites one from uh, the Washington Post which excoriated the golfers who'd chosen to play in the Saudi International described the appearance fees and prize pot as blood money uh, obviously he would have been a colleague of Jamal Khashoggi who was uh, killed so brutally and uh, Dennis concludes by saying sports washing can never take that away and I know a couple of the golf journalists Eamon Lynch for instance is uh, referring to the Saudi International next week as the Bonesaw International uh, obviously a reference to the brutal na nature of uh, Khashoggi's uh, murder. Uh, Kieran, I know you, you wrote a critical piece of uh, Shane Larry. We've been critical of Shane Larry here on the Sunday pay per view last week and on the Golf Weekly podcast on the back of his comments where he said, Look, I'm a politician and I have to provide for my uh, family. Uh, Dennis here taken a, a wider view of our relationship with Saudi Arabia. It is beyond uh, golf, obviously, and it goes to governmental level and to various other sports. The, the golfers, though, uh, have taken a lot of the ire and have caught the public imagination on this front. Yeah, well, uh, uh, like there's definitely a, a level, I don't know if you call it double standards or hypocrisy, you could call it that, that if you want, in that, you know, the, uh, as a state, Ireland deals with Saudi Arabia all the time, and so many Irish companies do, and that's the case with the UK, with the US, etc. You know, it's a case across the board that it's a hugely important trade partner. But, 
I think the golf situation is very different to say Formula One. You know, but so when you have uh, like if you if you if you take a stand on the Saudi Arabia Grand Prix and you say you're not going to go to Saudi Arabia, effectively you have to pull out of the drivers' championship. You know, you can't really absolutely pull out of one Grand Prix. You know, you're gone otherwise. You know, but the golfers have made a choice. So, say, for example, Roy McElroy has chosen not to go. Mm. Shane Lowry and a lot of others have chosen to go. And ultimately, it comes down to money. And I like I find that piece hard to write because I admire Shane Lowry greatly. And I would say, in my memory, Shane Lowry, Katie Taylor, and Paul McGrath are probably the three most universally admired Irish sports people. You know, some others are a bit divisive. Do you find it very hard to find anybody with a bad word to say about those three? And strangely enough, this could have been an issue for Katie Taylor as well, and it could be in the future, because if Anthony Joshua v. Tyson Fury does go ahead, there's a fair chance it will happen in Saudi Arabia. And if, if it does, I would say, uh, if the fight does happen, I would say there's a very good chance Katie Taylor will be in the undercard. So she would have to face questions of that as well. And, you know, and I do accept a lot of arguments Dennis is making, but there's still huge issues with that country. You know, the Jamal Khashoggi uh, situation in particular was an a- absolute scandal, you know, what, what was done to that journalist. And, um, I don't know. I, the argument didn't stand up to Shane Larry and basically saying, I, you know, I defeat my family, to paraphrase him. You know, and he's one of the wealthiest Irish sports people of all time. And given the nature of golf, he probably earned serious money for another 20 years if he stays in good enough health. So I think people are looking for an out in a way. You know, they don't want to criticize Shane Larry. You know, racing definitely has been bad with the Saudis for a long, long time. But there's a lot of stuff around racing that should be questioned more anyway. But uh, the, the big issue with it, uh, Joe, is it's a deliberate policy by the Saudi state. Sports washing is a policy. No, they've embraced sport across the board. And it's spent throwing so much money at different sports because they want to launder the reputation through the sport. You know, you can't get away from that. That's yeah. the reason they're doing it. It's not due to a great love of golf or Formula One or athletics or whatever. It's wanting to clean the reputation and, and sport is a great way of doing it. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, Grania, sorry, I hate to do this live on air. You might try and turn down your uh, speakers on your laptop just as, obviously we, you need to be able to hear us, but just I think we're getting a lot of feedback your mic's picking up the sound and it's uh, going round and round and um, we're uh, we're probably driving people to distraction so uh, if you can that'd be great apologies to, to try and fix that live on air but we're just having a few situations what do you make of the Saudi situation then the golfers are going someone like Shane Larry you know saying I'm not a politician I've got to provide for my family others are taking more of a stand I mean I like Paul Casey a year ago or two years ago said call me a hypocrite if I ever go there and you know what they've done in Yemen and the human rights record and uh, lo and behold he's very much there now and uh, going so we've had the full spectrum yeah it's it's a difficult one because it is about the money it's all about the money um, and it's a it, it is a dilemma as well and I think we all like Shane Larry so much and he's such a really lovely guy and and you know, there's a lot of other golfers that are doing it beyond just Shane Lowry heading over there to play golf. So, but I think from an Irish perspective, you know, are you know, are we expecting him to be this perfect role model as well? I think there's questions in all of us, like, well, what do we want him to do either? Like, you know, and I think genuinely probably he's being honest when he says, you know, um, I'm not a politician, I'm a golfer, and this is a this is a professional place that I'm going to go and play golf in. You no, know, most of us don't like it because of everything that's all around it. Yeah, and, and I suppose the the, the the repost to that would be you don't need to be a professional politician on Shane's part to understand why uh, this is re- a really questionable decision to make. You don't need to be a golfer, or sorry, a, a politician. You can just be citizen of the world, I suppose, taking a, a fairly superficial interest in what's going on. Uh, this is not like HSBC-sponsored tournament in Saudi Arabia. It's very much... Uh, from the PIF and, uh, you know, the murder of Khashoggi, just one of the many accusations hanging over these very same people that you're taking money from. So, you know, to say I'm not a politician, that's fine. I don't know if you need professional politicking to understand why going there is, uh, like I said, really questionable. And the other thing, I suppose, is, yes, everyone has to provide for their families, but, uh, you know, Shane's won 20 million prize money and there is a tournament on at uh, Pebble Beach that same weekend on the PGA Tour where the first prize is over a million dollars and the 
uh, full purse is a seven million dollar prize fund. So there are, you know, there are readily available options here to dodge this one, which is kind of the frustration, I think. And that's why maybe just saying, well, I have to provide for my family and I'm not a politician almost actually. I think he was trying to be honest to his credit, but actually it, it, uh, it almost put his head above the parapet more than a few others. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we, we all know what's right, Joe, and we all know what's wrong. Like we, we do, as, as adults, we do know what's right and, and we know what's wrong. And obviously this is something he's discussed with his family. He, he's obviously aware of everything that's happened. He's a well-read person. Um, and this is a decision that he made to do that. Um, you know, Roy McIlroy didn't. Can you argue? Well, Roy McIlroy is in the top 10. You know, he doesn't need to go there. He has a lot more financial money. I, I'm just throwing this out as devil's advocate appreciate the amount of money that they're all on is huge um but it's a decision he's made now and and he's going to be there but um yeah it is questionable it is a difficult it's a, it's a state that's looking to actually be considered legitimate and by you actually going around and just saying yeah and, and participating in these events it is a moral dilemma for each of these golfers that are involved in doing it but it, it seems by playing there they've made that decision for themselves and I think probably money is the reason why they're going there. It has, it is the reason why they're going there. There's massive amounts of money there, and they just feel, yeah, if I can go here, do successfully here, that sets me up really, really nicely. Kieran, uh, Declan McBennett, head of RT Sport, interviewed in the Mail on Sunday by Mark Gallagher. What's from there to you here? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I find this interesting. Like, um, like Grania, I'm sure Grania knows Declan as well. Like, I know Declan, so you know, I have to compare that. I like Declan. I wouldn't say we're friends, but like I've interviewed him a couple of times, and uh, you know, was in a panel on the on the RT Sports Board the last few years, and I just find that it interesting because he doesn't give that many interviews, but he's somebody that's talked about a huge amount because so many people have an opinion about um, RTE Sports, and I think a lot of the criticism he gets is unfair because I think a lot of people don't recognise the reality. Uh, I have to find it. Oh, yeah, I found it now. Yeah. Uh, the reality of what RT is, like RT is not a sports channel. For example, League of Ireland fans would be very critical in particular of uh, the, the amount of games that are covered there. But if you look at domestic leagues around the world, how many are actually shown on a, you know, a state channel that isn't a sports channel? You know, the, like it's a, the, so it's a very different... It's very, it's very hard to please everybody. Like boxing fans want more boxing, athletics fans want more athletics. Even people think there's a huge amount of GA, but GA fans want an extra highlight program on a Monday, and they want a magazine program midweek. That you cannot please everybody, especially when budgets have been slashed across the board in RT as they have, and especially as rights issues are so uh, competitive now. So it just gives, uh, you know, it just uh, it makes a point here. There's plenty of noise. The two most common complaints that McBennett hears is, why aren't you showing more of the sport I like? And why do you have such and such in the telly? They don't know what they're talking about. And no matter what he does, you will get those two questions. That's the bottom line. Like, like, like you, I know Ryan Lugin pretty well, his predecessor. And Ryan would be dismissed by some GA or soccer fans as a rugby man. But as Ryan points out, they lost a lot of rugby rights at this watch. Mm. You know, it doesn't come down to what... People say McBennett's a GA man, but like there's been more, uh, you know, the spread of sports now on RT is probably greater than it ever has been. Like even though League of Ireland fans are so critical, there's more soccer in RT now than there ever has before because they show women's internationals, show uh, underage internationals. There's more European games, uh, international football games, etc. So I think it's one of the most difficult jobs in Irish sport. And this interview gives an insight into how hard it is. Okay, well, that's on page 66, 67 of the mail on Sunday. I'm going to keep things moving before time really comes against us. Uh, Grania, I know you wanted to mention Ash Barty. Nadal, by the way, has won his 21st Grand Slam title uh, just in the last uh, 20 minutes or so in Melbourne. Ash Barty bridged a huge gap for the home crowd yesterday. Page 15 of the Sunday Times, caught you right? Yeah, it did actually, Joe. And do you know what? I, caught my eye on a number of things. I'm just getting it here now. Um Basically, because the Australian Open, it started off terribly and that all the shadow of Novak Djokovic. And that's all we were talking about, that you were kind of afraid that that would totally overcast everything on, on the Australian Open. And we've had really good feel-good stories in Australia. But Nadal winning is huge. Those that don't like Novak Djokovic will be thrilled that he's the person that has got the 21st Grand Slam title and not, and not Djokovic. 
But what I loved about um, Barry, and I thought was really nice, it was a really um, lovely news story. But the fact, the fact that um, Ivan Gulagan Kali presented the cup to her, and that has been her idol and considered her friend. And of course, Ivan Gulagan Kali is seven-time Grand Slam singles ch- champion and a huge, huge sporting icon in Australia. Um, so that I thought that was lovely. And just the pressure that she would have been under coming into that game. I mean, they, they increased the number of fans able to win and watch that. And even before the match is quoted here by Stuart Fraser, um, Barty received a standing ovation from 12,000 spectators as she walked onto the court. You had like Kathy Freeman and Ian Thorpe, who are two major superstars, obviously, in Australia as well. And they're present in the audience. So for someone to actually have done that and, and that pressure around her um, is huge and 44 years since the last time an Australian um, person won that but also as a quote here like she's won the French Open in 2019 and Wimbledon last year she joined Serena Williams Roger Federer Rafael Nadal and Djokovic as the only active players across the men's and women's tours to have won major trophies in all three surfaces of hard grass and clay so I just thought it was lovely she's only 25 as well so it, it's just a really lovely news story um, from her and well done on that and achieving that yeah third Grand Slam so she'll be going for the career Grand Slam at the US Open uh, there's uh, lots of GA to finish up on then we touched on some of it at the start obviously Dublin Armagh uh, there's a full spectrum of things Michael Dignan for instance uh, stay positive or how else how do you stay going so he's taking a more philosophical look at the return of sports and he's from the community which is uh, in particular mourning Ashleen Murphy and Tullamore and he starts off his piece writing about her and talked about the eight point of grief around the country and he uh, was at the vigil and uh, his uh, sons went to the school where she uh, taught once upon a time and he, he says I have to say the week after her death was one of the toughest I've ever put down and he also adds that his father lived a great life but died during COVID. We didn't get to give him a traditional send off to celebrate his life. All of these things are going on in the background of people's lives. I run my own business, chair the county board, you try and stay busy. And so um, something like sport coming back obviously is a welcome distraction for lots of people. So that's Michael Dignan in the Mail on Sunday, for instance. There's an interview with Colin McShane and he's reliving, I suppose, the injury and his comeback and the effect he had in the championship. Colm O'Rourke is talking about the importance of the league. Uh, Dermot Crow goes to Ushin Mullins local town and talks to people there about the, well, I, the, the, uh, what seemed like almost the sense of um, tragedy when he was leaving for Australia and, and the happiness that he's staying on. So there's a kind of full spectrum of GAA pieces. I don't know, Kieran, which one you wanted to mention? Yeah, uh, I'll mention the, the Dermot Crow's piece on Ushin Mullins because um, I think when he decided to stay here, like this, uh, you know, Gillong were very keen on him. It was made clear for a couple of years, they were very keen on him. But it looks like he was done. And like his guy's been twi- one young footballer of the year twice in a row. And like he's such a huge talent and he was such a loss to Mayo. And just, uh, you know, the kind of what so many people thought when he decided he did the U turn, decided to stay here, he's down to Mayo and wanted to give it a shot with Mayo. But it just highlights the importance of the club. And it reminded me of Michael Murphy, like, because uh, Kilmaine would be, Glenn Swilly would be kind of similar to Kilmaine uh, back in the day, and that there were a club that were barely talked about in Donegal, and Neil Gallagher, firstly, and then particularly Michael Murphy came along, and they made them into, you know, uh, uh, Division One teams who'd end up winning county titles and you know, very strong clubs. And, uh, but like the love, basically, you know, this comes down to his love of club and his love of the place and how important the Mullen family have been. You know, himself and his brothers have been to that team. And I think the draw of home could be underestimated, even because it reminds me, like, people forget now, when Michael Murphy was 17 or 18, like, there was huge attraction, uh, a huge interest in him from Aussie Rose Scouts. A lot of people thought he would go, but he's just such a home bird. He wanted to stay home. And it wasn't just only goal, it was Ben Swilly. And I see a bit of that uh, with... Uh, Oh, she Mullen, like it just, and Mayo Donegal on the background, Mayo Donegal wouldn't have been three points, and they could do with Oshie Mullen today, like he's, he's, um, he's a real talent. I'm glad he's staying for wrong sake, because I have no interest in Aussie rules, and I want to see him play for Mayo. <laughs> yeah, I think it was a good idea to go to the local town and talk to people, you know, you get stuff like, oh, he worked in the local centre, and he, great way with customers, always smiling, so you get all these local people who've known him all the way through. Grania, any GAPs you wanted to mention? 
Yeah, just just briefly, that, that and the Cahill McShane piece, I just, I just think, I thought it was a lovely way the article was done by Dermot Crow and that you went and talked to the local people about him um, and those that knew him, I thought it was really, really lovely. Um, but also you get a sense of the amount of work the players put in. Like he was just, there's a, like 2019, he basically went to the gym and developed himself. This comes from, um, you know, co- cousins of his is John by Michael John Mullen and Ollie Walsh in the piece. And they just talk about the work that he's transferred him, himself physically to get to where he is now. So there's a, there's a lot of kind of loneliness and, and work ethic that has to go in to be the best at what, what you do. And that kind of was the theme in the Cahill McShane piece as well. Like he yeah. suffered real injuries and obviously with Aussie rules came back and didn't realise his granny was from Tory Island. That I didn't realise that. Um, so a, a Donegal um, granny. So basically he, but again, when he stopped, he shattered his ankle. And I think he did that up in Shum actually, um, playing against Galway. And I think I actually might've been covering that game for RT that day. But what it showed here is that the amount of work that he had to do, and he was really honest about the work, Joe, like the loneliness nearly swallowed him up. I remember days going in, just a couple of minutes, being in there thinking, right, this isn't working today. He says, back home, you go in the car, five minutes journey, which seems like a half an hour. And he just talked about visu- visualization and he visualized going to be in Crow Park in the All Ireland final. I visualized all that. I've seen myself making an impact in games. That definitely helped me through those days in the gym. I really believe good things will come if you believe and work hard. That's what made that final win that extra bit special. So it was just a really nice interview um, from Michael Foley, just getting a sense of, of Cahill McShane, who he is, and the injury and, and the work that he has gone through to get to back to where he is um, as a footballer as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, guys, great stuff. Appreciate that. Grania Michael Wayne, broadcaster with TG Carr, RTE, Sky Sports. Thank you. And Kieran Cunningham, Chief Sports Writer with the Irish Daily Star. Thanks so much. Appreciate the time. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Grania. The Sunday Papers on Off the Ball. Psychology, performance analysis, sports therapy, and coaching all contribute to elite performance in sport. At Portobello Institute, we offer full time and blended learning honours degrees in each of these sporting disciplines, affordable and